Okay, right. we are um, in in Sefer Yeshayahu Perak Lamed Zayin, right. chapter thirty seven, and what I want to do is a little different today, and that is I want to start at the end of the Perak. We know the story. This is a story we learned before in Sefer Melachim Bet and Perak Yud Tet, and it is the story of Sancheriv's siege on Yerushalayim. Last week we had, or two weeks ago when we last met, we had dealt with Rav Shaked, with the minister from Sancheriv threatening the Jewish people. If you recall, he threatened them in Hebrew specifically, which was to be able to try to demoralize the, the citizens of Yerushalayim. And Chizkiyahu's ministers had requested a switch into Aramaic, which was the royal language, back and forth, a number of interesting things. It was one of the reasons why Chazal suggests that Rav Shakeh was actually a mummer, was an apostate, had been Jewish. That's how he knew the Hebrew. It was also the fact that he spoke in Hebrew and not in the regal tongue of Aramaic. It may have also been as simple as being an insult to Chizkiyahu and to his ministers. Yerushalayim is placed under siege at that time. And we'll see at the beginning of this parak that when the word comes to Chizkiyahu, both of the siege and also of the uh, extreme insolence of Rav Shakeh and his people, that he'll tear Kriya. He'll be in mourning. But at the end of the story, since we've learned this story in the past, and it's a pretty famous story, you remember there's a miracle which occurs. And that miracle decimates 185,000 soldiers within Sancheriv's army. And part and Sancheriv goes back, as we would say, with his tail between his legs, back to Ashur, back to Nineveh, his capital. But I just want to look at the end of it because I want to start with some with a piece of archaeology. So if you turn to Perak Lamed Zayin, Pasuk Lamed Vav, the end. Vayetze Malach Hashem, that an angel of God came out, Vayakeh B'machaneh Ashur, and smote in the encampment of, of, the, of the Assyrian armies, Me'a Ushmonim V'chamisha Aleph, 185,000 soldiers. Now, interestingly, the parallel a verse of this in Sefer Melachim starts out, Balai Lahu, and that evening, and what the Balaila, who could possibly be, according to the Medrash, that this was the night of Pesach. Balaila, who in that night, it wasn't just the night that Sancheriv may have come back to strengthen the siege, but it may have been on the night of Pesach itself. He sends out this Malach. All of them, Rashi says, the 185,000 people were elite troops. Elite troops, he actually is Rosh Gaisot. These are actually uh, officers who were killed. And they woke up in the morning, and who the waking up in the morning could be, the simple explanation would seem to be the Jews of Yerushalayim woke up in the morning and they saw they were all dead. According to the Gemara in Sanhedrin and Daft Sadi Hayamud Aleph, Sancheriv and his sons, who were there in the army, they woke in the in the encampment, they woke up in the morning and they realized that all of these people had died, and they traveled, and he traveled, and he went, and he returned, did this. These three verbs are an interesting piece. And the very, I mean, the parallel verse says, that he returned back to his country ashamed. Rav Schwab actually suggests that these multiplicity of verbs, normally a multiplicity of verbs implies something quickly. You do something very quickly. Um, but you would imagine for a moment, he probably not hurrying to go back to his hometown and going back to the invade of his capital, because this is a major defeat. And so Rav Schwab actually suggests it's the, ap the absolute opposite, that it shows the hesitation that he travels and then he goes... And then he returns. It's one step after the next, showing a hesitation of what happens when he goes back. Vayeshev in Nivei, and he lived in Nivei. Vayehiu mishtachave bet nisroch elohav. And he is now going the, the temple of his god, bet nisroch. And is this story, even though it appears to be immediately afterwards, took place somewhere between eight and 20 years later in terms of this, the historical documents. 
Adramelech v'shar Etzer banav, and his two sons, Adramelech and Shar Etzer, what do they do? He kuhu b'charev. They assassinate him. They kill him by sword. And when they assassinate him with sword, the question is, why exactly did they do this? Okay, and ultimately, they, uh, the Medrash suggests that, uh, and it's an interesting Medrash, the Radak quotes this Medrash, that they were trying to figure out why the Jews had been so successful against them, why this miracle had occurred. And he's told, well, the reason the miracle occurred was all because of Schut Avraham, because of the merit of Avraham. And what had Avraham Avinu done that was so meritorious? He had brought his son up to the altar to be killed, Akedas Yitzchak. The two sons here, that their father has, according to the Medrash, the father finds out what's the secret of the Jews and he was ready to sacrifice his kids. And so therefore, the uh, the son of Sancheriv, the, the sons of Sancheriv decide right then and there, they better not take any risks. And they uh, they they knock off their father. And as the parak as the parak ends then, and the two sons who assassinated their father escape. They go to the land of Ararat, which is in Turkey, versus Assyria, which is more in the Syrian Iraqi area. And they go off to Ararat, and another one of his sons takes over. Okay. That's the end of the story. Now, what's fascinating is that we actually have the story from an Assyrian source. And for those of you who are online, I sent it last night, uh, but I'll pull it up as well. Hopefully I still have it on my desktop. Um, let me just get it. Uh, okay. And I'm just, I'm pulling up the document itself on the desktop. For those who are online, you'll be able to see it in just a moment. Um, moment, there it is. Okay. They discovered what's called the Rassam Cylinder of Ashur Banipal. Now, Ashur Banipal is the grandson of Sanacherif. Okay, so his son, we see in this pasuk, took over. And then when that son died, his grandson took it over. It's from about at 643 BCE. This cylinder is located in the British Library. And I, and I pull it up because of the contents of this. Now, the University of Chicago, as we all know, is a great source of information. If you just... and uh, Professor Luckinbill, who was a professor at UFC, actually published what's called the Ancient Records of Assyria and Babylonia. That's just the second page that you see the book. And uh, then we move on. And in this book, what he does is, uh, there is, this book is a transcription of what's on the cylinder, of what they've, you know, deciphered from the cylinder itself. So this is an account that comes two generations after Sennacherib. The, gra the grandson of the person who's the subject of our chapter. And in this account, he talks about the different military campaigns which took place in the time, in this one, uh, in the time of the Assyrians. Here is the, as it says, the third campaign against Syria, Palestine, and the siege of Yerushalayim. In other words, it's literally the siege of Yerushalayim that we read about in this parak, which we haven't actually gotten to yet, but we will, we just start at the end. And he writes, and if you just, I'm just jumping over very quickly, if you notice what the blue, okay, I've highlighted the pieces that are parallel one to the next. So the first thing goes ahead and it says who he conquers, okay, King of Sidon. And on the next page, and he talks about him, and then he talks about all the cities, that's in the pink color, okay. Then the yellow color talks about uh, who, takes over for the king of Sidon, in this case, Tubalu, okay? I see that on the royal throne over them. And then the the taxes they gave, okay? And that's in the, I guess it's a lightish green or, or whatever we're going to call it, okay? Then the next conquest of a king, and the next conquest of the king was the king of Ashkelon, okay? But Sidka, king of Ashkelon, had not submitted to my yoke, the gods of his father's house, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, then it says in the yellow, okay, who he put over, who he, who replaced Sidka, okay, uh, Sharuladari replaced Sidka, and talks about the tribute he paid, that's in like a little bit of a greenish color, and then comes, okay, all of the cities they captured, they captured Beit Dagon and Yafo, okay, and all of these other places. Next, the same pattern, a third set, here is, okay, Alatku, okay, he captured, okay, and this was the king of, of Kush, this is one of the Egyptians 
uh, uh, pieces that he had. And it talks about the cities. He got Ekron, killed all the people there. He hung them. Who he put in his place, Patti, their king, I brought out of Jerusalem. I set him on the royal throne. That's those battles that led up to the next one, which you see the underlined red. As for Zechariah, the Jew did not submit to my yoke. 46 of his strong walled cities, as well as the small cities in the neighborhood, which were without number, and there were so many, by Escalade and by bringing up siege engines, by attacking and storming on foot by mines, tunnels, and breaches, I besieged and took those cities, 200,150 200, people, great and small, male, female, horses, mules, asses, camels, cattle, and sheep without number, I brought away from them and counted as spoil. Well, we know, we've talked about that he conquered all these cities when before he came up to Yerushalayim. The most significant of the cities that he conquered was Lachish. Lachish was second only to Yerushalayim in terms of its power in the time of Chizkiyahu. And then he says himself, like a caged bird, I shut up in Yerushalayim as royal city. Well, he says, I placed Yerushalayim under siege. That's last parak and this parak. Earthworks I threw up against him. The, on, the one coming out of a city gate, I turned back his misery. In other words, he didn't let anyone out of Yerushalayim. The cities of his, which I had despoiled, I cut off from his land. And then in the you know in this pink, it talks about, well, those cities that I just mentioned, all the cities around Yerushalayim, I took out. And then it says, okay, I took those cities and I gave them to Metinti, okay, it was the king of Ashkon and Pad Padel, king of Ekron, and Silibel, king of Gaza. So he gave all the small cities around Yerushalayim, which have been captured in Yudah. And then it talks about all of the spoils. In addition to 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver, blah, 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 all the way down. And that's, okay, that to pay tribute and to accept servitude, he dispatched his messengers. And that's the end of the story of Chizkiyahu. Fascinating, in this um, Rasm cylinder, unlike every other battle, when it comes to Chizkiyahu, the battle against Chizkiyahu, it never says that he captured Yerushalayim. He skips the step of capturing Yerushalayim. And what is suggested in Chaim Tadmor, in a, in a pretty well-known article um, of his that had appeared in the Jubilee volume, the Sefer Yovel of um, Zion, of the journal Zion, Chaim Tadmor suggests that really what we see out of this Rasm cylinder is the miracle that we read about at the end of this parak. Because something happened to Sancherev and his armies that unlike every other place they were able to conquer, they were unable to conquer Yerushalayim. There's no record of their conquest of Yerushalayim. There is a record of the, the bribe, okay, of all the spoils they got. We do know that Chizkiyahu initially, this is Divrei Amim that we did last week, that Chizkiyahu initially does try to bribe him to get some peace. We talk about all the other cities that were conquered, but Yerushalayim is not mentioned. And the suggestion that Tad Moore makes is not only does this support the end of this parak that we're learning, that we're going to learn today, but it also may have been the way that Sanjera put his best face forward when he returned back to Nineveh. Because if you come back to Nineveh and you have been unsuccessful in capturing Yerushalayim, how do you say that? So what you do is you gloss over it. You don't say anything happened. You just talk about all the things that did happen. And based on this, Ted Moore suggests, you know, obviously they're not talking, in the Rasam Cylinder, there's no um, proof of a miracle. There are, Herodotus talks about a similar kind of uh, failure that had occurred with, Herodotus being the famous Greek historian, the the fa uh, similar failure that had happened to Sanchera, but he doesn't attribute it to Yerushalayim, he attributes it, attributes it to Egypt, he doesn't attribute it to miraculous just death, he says they were infested with rats, and the rats ate all of their armor and all of their, uh, their weapons, okay, Josephus has something similar to it as well, but when I look in this parak and I see there was a miracle and I know the miracle isn't mentioned by the enemy, it doesn't mean anything. It just means it wasn't mentioned. It doesn't mean the miracle didn't happen. No, miracle could, could and most likely happened exactly as it's mentioned here, even though there are a couple of differences in terms of when the assassination took place. Let me rephrase that. The miracle happened. That's what we have in the Tanakh. There's no reason not to, to buy it. And when we look in the secular record, there's even more reason to say, hey, it happened. Leah, yeah. 
see it's pretty generic to the misses that fail. Whenever, whenever an enemy fails in a campaign, by the way, the United States does this also. Remember, when uh, the United States withdrew from Vietnam, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a withdrawal. Okay, they had succeeded in their mission. We can talk about all the times. Whenever one army fails in its uh, in its stated goals, it'll put the base, best fa face forward. We see it, and so we see it all the time. We see it even with Jews. Uh, as well with Jewish armies and things, we put the best face forward on things. But this is this is what Sanchev did, and it's just fascinating to have it within his records or his grandson's records. Is two hundred? Yeah, two. is two hundred thousand the the number of exiles that is that? No, that's not. This is not the same kind of exiles. This is this. Remember, the Assyrians exiled the northern kingdom, right? This is the southern kingdom. So this normally is not included within the number of exiles. Normally, we talk about the exiles of the southern kingdom. We're talking about the Babylonians, who were going to succeed within three gen about three generations, the the Assyrians of the north. Uh, the number seems reasonable in the sense that we talk about 185,000 soldiers have laid siege to Jerusalem. Well, if we can talk about those kind of numbers in Yerushalayim, then we can talk about those numbers of people who lived in the outskirts and all around the, the, the kingdom of Judea. Basically, the, the way the Tanakh presents it is if you look at Yehuda and the conquest when Sanchev came down, Sanchev came down with his armies and he decimated most of the land, okay, except for Yerushalayim. He was unsuccessful. So that's my question. In terms of history, how big was Jerusalem compared to today? Much, much smaller. Yerushalayim, of, Yerushalayim then, you know, was uh, had expanded a little bit beyond the classic Ir David area. So if you uh, if you think about the Temple Mount, and then you know where the, the city of David, when you go south, you know, in Silwan, which is like a finger sticking out, and it had expanded a bit, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't a massive city. It was a massive city in ancient. Uh, compared concepts to compared to other compared to in ancient times massive cities were not massive okay they were compared to us they probably make uh, uh, Skokie was big is big okay uh, but the reality is uh, it was a major city and that major city of Yerushalayim was the city that ma was maintained and then Chizkiyahu rebuilds and there's a tremendous amount of rebuilding so I started with the end of the story, but we got to get to the beginning of the story. So if you would turn back now uh, to Perak Lamed Zion Pasuk Aleph. Vayehi Kishmoa HaMelech Chizkiyahu. And it's when the King Chizkiyahu hears. Now, if you remember, last, in the last Perak, Rav Shake refused to use Chizkiyahu's title. He was always just referring to him by his first name, Chizkiyahu. And here... Specifically, the Navi is using Chizkiyahu. He is the king of, of Yehuda. And he tears Kriya, and he covers himself with sackcloth. The reason of tearing Kriya and sackcloth is twofold, typically within the Chazal. One piece is when you go ahead and you are causing your own personal suffering, but also when the king does it. It's a major statement. Think about for a moment Mordechai HaYehudi, who was just an officer in the Persian court, where he puts on sackcloth, and it's trying to make a statement. Well, he has this immediate reaction, a guttural reaction. He immediately goes to the Beit HaMikdash. And he goes and he sends out Eliakim, okay, and Eliakim obviously is one of his important ministers, okay. Ve'et Shevna has so fair, and he also sends out Shevna, the scribe, again, the, the chronicler. Ve'et Zignea Kohanim, and now he throws in the Zignea Kohanim, the Zignea Kohanim, the elders of the Kohanim. This is after his initial davening in the Beit HaMikdash, he sends them out, and he sends them, Mitkasim Sakim, they too are in mourning, El Yishayahu v'namot Sanavi, over to Yishayahu. Why are they sending the delegation? Obviously, they're sending the delegation over so that Yishayahu will give them direction, will plead with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. One of the things, the Gemara Megillah, we've talked about this before, is we need to remember that Amot and Amatsya were brothers. Amotz is Yeshayahu ben Amotz. It's the father of Yeshayahu. His name is Amotz. Amatzia 
is the great great grandfather of Chizkiyahu. Chizkiyahu is the son of Achaz, who's the son of Yotam, who's the son of Uziyahu, who's the son of Amatzia. Okay. Now, why wouldn't the king go himself? And the Kumar Brachos says, and Dafyot, it says, because even though this is a time of crisis, the king still has to preserve his honor. There's a certain dignity to the, the, the royal role. And he, if, he, if it can work with sending his key messengers, he does so as well. And when they go, and he says, he says to them, Ko amar I want you to tell the following to Yeshayahu. He is not calling himself Hamela Chizkiyahu. He says, I want you to tell Yeshayahu, this is what Chizkiyahu is saying. Okay. So even though he has to be makbid on his cover, according to the Gemara, when it comes to appealing to Yeshayahu, who is, if I have it, if again, if I have the generations right, he's the great, great, great uncle. Uh, no, he's a cousin, uh, four times first cousin, like four times removed. Yom hayom This is a day of tochecha. This is a day of naatsa uh, of strife on this day. Now, what is tochecha? Tochecha Rashi says it's a day where the rishaim are mitvakim. They're, they're fighting and they want to go ahead and they want to prove, okay, that they say they have the power. Tochecha, according to Rashi, comes from the same Shorish as Vikuach, of a battle. The Radak says, no, Tochecha is more from the word Lahochiach. Lahochiach in this term is uh, to give Musr, to re reprove. Now, um, Hirsch points out that Tochecha comes from the word from Hochacha. Hochacha actually means proof. Okay, to reprove and prove, as the same Shorish also, it's proof. What is it? What, what do you mean? They've come to prove what they've come to prove something bad. The tochacha is normally from comes from that word of hochacha, and it sources that you want to prove something that generally is bad. You want to go ahead and you want to give musr. You want to say you're miserable people. You've done. You've sinned, and I'm going to show you that you've sinned. That's what tochacha can be in that kind of sense. And what he says is. Kivau vanimad mashber, your children have come to the birthing stool, and they don't have the, the strength to push and to give birth. Now, it's an interesting um, mashal that's being offered, a parable that's being offered. Rashi says it, it's just the level of pain is extraordinary and they can't do anything. Okay, they can't get over that pain that they're suffering. Rosh Schwab says actually that the leida is a leidat geulang that your children have come, they're almost there. They're almost where they need to be. But they feel they don't have that strength to go that final push and, and reach the redemption. Why don't they have that final strength? Because of sins that they bear. At that point, Maybe what maybe our salvation in essence will be that God will hear what Rav Shake had said. Rav Shake, who was sent by the king of Ashur, his master, to blaspheme the living God. And Rav Shake went ahead and he used words to try to give us the re reproof, Asher Shema Hashem Elokecha, which God has heard. Venasata Tfila Ba'ad Hasherit HaNimtzah. And we're asking you at that point to please pray on behalf of the remnants that, that are found. Now, what's happening at this point is, if you notice, there's a number of different things that Chizkiyahu could plead about. Chizkiyahu could be saying, Hey, you know, he's threatening us. He's threatening to kill us. He's threatening to overthrow us. He's threatening to exile us, all of which Rav Shakeh had said. But instead, instead, Chizkiyahu is only focusing on blasphemy. He's focusing on the one point that he feels that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to respond to. Because ultimately, he wants HaKadosh Baruch Hu, okay, to respond to that challenge that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was facing. He went against, not only going, is he going against us, but he went against you, and that's the blasphemy that's being suffered.
Vayavoa de Amelech is Gael Yeshayah. And they come to Yeshayah. Now, it's a little strange because if you look in Pasuk Gimel, it says Vayomer Elav. They were there. And then in Pasuk Hay, in verse 5, it says they come. Well, weren't they already there? So there are two different explanations that are typically offered on this. One explanation is it's more stylistic um, within the text that sometimes you say, I want you to do this, and they did this, and then they came. That it, It's not in a chronological order, but it's the literary style that's being used. According, however, according to the Kliyakar, Kliyakar says, no, no, no. There were multiple delegations that Chizkiyahu had sent to Yeshayahu to ask him to get involved. The first delegation made this speech, and now a second delegation is coming, and they appear before Yeshayahu. And so Yeshayahu responds to them, This is what I want you to convey back to Chizkiyahu. This is what God has told. Don't be concerned about what you heard. Which the the servants of um, um of Sancherev, the Naare Melech Ashur, have blasphemed me. Now, why is this taking place? Well, you notice there's two things. First is Pasuke talks about Avdeha Melech, the servants of the king. And the response is the Naare Sancherev. And the response is to the Na'arim. A na'ar is a teenager. Okay, In Yiddish, na'ar is a fool. right? Mm -hmm. And the fascinating thing always comes down. I always tell people, if you ever want to talk about foolish behavior, it's always associated with teenagers. Mm -hmm. Okay, There's na'arishkeit. There's mm -hmm. adolescent behavior. Okay, Always fools are, are, are associated with teenagers. But na'ar also means a servant. Bu na'ar at b'nei bilhau b'nei zilpa, talking about Yosef. We have na'ar in that terminology. But if I'm looking at who's representing Yeshayahu, I mean, who's representing Chizkiyahu? They're the servants, the Avdei HaMelech. Who's representing Sancherev, the Na'arei HaMelech? Okay, it's that one piece. Number two is, as very simple as we're saying, that there's an element of mocking them. Okay, there's an element of saying, hey, this is the uh, Rabbi Novich says this in, in the Dat Sofrim, we're mocking. These are just these minimal, these minimal, these nothings who came before, before us to challenge us. One more piece, and just to notice, if I look in Posuke and I take it like the Pshat presents, that the servants of Chizkiyahu came to Yeshayahu, we don't see there immediately after Posuke, I would expect them to open their mouths and say something. There's absolutely nothing they've said, but rather they just come and Shayao knew why they were coming. And so he responds not to a request, but to their presence. It's one of those moments, which fits very nicely, by the way, into the clay car, if you think about it, because the clay car suggests that there were multiple groups. And so the first group had made the pitch, and come, along comes the second group, and Yeshayar says, don't even say anything. Let me tell you what, what God said along this way. Posuk Zion. Hinanino tenbo ruach, I am going, says God, to put into Sancherev's head this ruach, and it's a ruach of shtut. It's a ruach. It's some kind of thought of doing something strange. V'shamash muai is going to hear something. V'shavila, so he's going to go back to his land. V'hipaltiv becherev barzo. And I'm going to, and he's going to fall by sword in his uh, in his land. Now, the uh, Barbanel actually says uh, there's four different pieces. One is. He actually says, it's not a Ruach Shtutas, but actually a spirit. I'm going to give him the sense that he can fight, that he has the power to fight. He has the spirit, the fighting spirit. And he's going to hear some kind of, of, of thing. What he's going to hear, we'll see a little bit later, that Tarheka was the king of the Egyptians. He was the founder of a new uh, Ethiopian dynasty that had taken over the Egyptians. That Tarheka was coming to fight him. Assyria, that he felt that at this time Sanacherev was split in his in his troops. He had troops outside Yerushalayim. He was still not completely finished with Lachish. And so Tarheka is going to come. He, he's going to attack Livna. Vishav Laratso. Ultimately, it says he is going to return to his land all in the singular. 
That singular is returned to the land, which we already saw, that after the defeat at Yerushalayim, he returns to the land. We know he falls at the hands of his sons. Livna itself, there's a, a question of when he's going to hear this thing and he's going to go back to Livna. There's a machloket where Livna is. Nowadays, we think that Livna is a place in Eretz Yisrael itself, about 15 kilometers away from Lachish, which was the major area, that the other city. Livna, Okay, Livne, it's called in the, by the Arabs. And in terms of the, the Radak says, no, the Livna is actually a place in Assyria. Whatever it is, it, there, there's no question that Sancherev's attention is going to be drawn away from the siege in Yerushalayim. And according to the Meforshim, he's being drawn away from the siege because there is a challenge to his power, and he's going to have to address that challenge. But he's told, but the set messengers who've now come from Chizkiah are basically told, don't worry, God is going to take care of this. Vayashov Rav Sheka. Now Rav Sheka, who had been in charge of the siege and had been representing what was going on in Yerushalayim, he returns to give his report. Remember, his report was he had challenged Chizkiah, he had tried to demoralize the people, but he hadn't been successful. So he goes back and, and, it, and even though he was planning on going back to where had been the military base, where Sancheriv was, he finds Sancheriv has moved. And once he sees Sancheriv has moved, he then goes ahead. Okay, he's leaving, he's traveled from away from Lachish. And he also hears, Rav Shake about... The, the challenge of Tirakam, who was the king of Ethiopia, who had been the, who had taken over Egypt. And now, remember, Egypt and Assyria are two major powers that are competing. And Egypt and Assyria, the two major powers that are competing, are also competing for the control of Eretz Yisrael always, because Eretz Yisrael is the bridge between okay both Africa and Asia. So whoever controls Eretz Yisrael has significant power. Tarheka is now... Uh, is now challenging him. Tirhak, I'm sorry, Tiraka is challenging. Nevertheless, he sends off messengers to Chizkiah. In other words, Rav Shake is going chasing after Sancherev. Sancherev has left the battle at Lachish. Sancherev has to deal with something else. And nevertheless, okay, he is sending a message to Chizkiah. Rashi says he's sending a message to Chizkiah because he wants to make sure Chizkiah doesn't misunderstand what's going on. He wants to make sure Chizkiah realizes that even though he is being drawn away, he's not forgetting about Yerushalayim. Okay? And all of that, he says, okay, he, he says to Chizkiah, now this again is a difference. Why? In the past, when he sent Rav Shakeh, Rav Shakeh is being sent to speak to the messengers of, of Chizkiyahu, you remember, o over the wall, but he did it in Hebrew, to be able to try to get to demoralize the nation. There is, by the way, a fascinating medrash based on an earlier piece of somebody else named Shevna that suggests that the Shevna Sofer actually had turned on Chizkiyahu, and there was an internal uh, rebellion that was taking place in Yerushalayim, whether or not to give in to, his, uh, give in to San Cherub or not. But this Peposhet Pshat is that San Cherub and Rav Shakeh were not successful in demoralizing the people. So according to the Abar Benel, what happens now is San Cherub is sending a messenger to Chizkiyahu. He's not sending it to the people. He's not sending it to the ministers he had inter interacted with before. He's sending one specifically to Chizkiyahu. Why Chizkiyahu? Because maybe he thought that if he wasn't able to demoralize the people, maybe he can talk tachlis to the leader. Because, you know, you go ahead and say, I have 80, 185,000 elite troops right around your city. I have conquered everybody else. The, I may not be, my PR campaign may not have worked but you, let's talk king to king for a minute. You have no hope. And let me talk directly. This is the Barbanel. Let me talk directly to Chizkiyahu. This is what you should say to him. And notice he's referring now to Chizkiyahu as Melech Yehuda. Okay. That, ult that ultimately it could be that he's talking to him king to king, or it could be as the Datami Mikra is saying, by the way, 
and you'll see in a minute, you're no different than every other king I have conquered. You're just another one in a long list of kings. Don't let your God carry you. It was trick you. You have trust in the more. To think that we're not, I'm not going to conquer Yerushalayim. Haven't you heard all that I've done to destroy all of the other the lands? Are you really think you're going to be saved? Everybody else I've conquered. Did any of those gods, which my forefathers have destroyed, at Gozan, at Haran, at Veretzef, at Vnei Adan, at Sherbit Lazar, any of these major cities, have any of them been saved? Ayei Melech Hamat, U Melech Arpad. Where are those kings of Hamat and Arpad? U Melech Lair, Sefavar Yim, Henea V'Ivam. Where are all of those kings? All of them have been defeated. All of them have been killed. You're no different. Now, these last two words, Henea V'Ivam, interestingly, are words that we're not 100% sure what they mean. And so if I look back in Sefer Melachim, Rashi proposes that it means those are just two cities, two other cities. However, it could be also, Hanea Viva means that they were shaking, okay? And he, he moved them and he, Eva, he destroyed them. And in fact, here, that's the approach of Mephoshim taking Yeshayahu. So you find the disagreement of the Mephoshim between these very same words, between the, the story in Melachim and the story here. Basically, there's two opinions. It could be these are cities. It could be what he did to them. Hanea in terms of sheikh. Lahania is to, 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 to like na'anuim uh, with the lulav. We shake a lulav is the same shorish as well. And Chizkiyahu took these books that had been sent to him. Now, he took them from the, the messengers who, and he read them. In other words, this was the way the message was sent. It was sent in a scroll. And he went up to the Beit HaMikdash. And he spread it out before HaKadosh Baruch Hu. is singular. Sfarim is plural. And so one possibility, like the Red says, he took one of the, the books, one of the books that uh, in, uh, had the threat in it, and he uh, spread it out. And he brought it like proof to HaKadosh Baruch Another possibility, the Radak quotes his father, who says Vifrasheu means he actually opened the book specifically to the place where Sancherev blasphemes God. Okay. Or the Dat Mikra says that it could be that uh, Sancherev sent multiple copies. Okay. There were, were no Xerox machines, so he sent a bunch of copies, and he and therefore his gallery to take one copy to the Beit HaMikdash to make his point. Now, Chizkiyahu, this is a tefillah of his for six psukim that we're going to encounter. And he says, Hashem Tzvakot, God of hosts. Now, Tzvakot is a, a sense of har, army. You know, we talk about a tzava, that sense as well. Elokei Yisrael, Yoshev HaKruvim, you God who sits between the cherubs. Now, what sits between the cherubs, the Ebenezer says, the Ebenezer says, that this means you are the God and he is never going to get into this place, into this Beit HaMikdash where the Kruvim were located. The Dat Mikras says, by the way, that interestingly, Yoshev Livnet Ben Kruvim, remember when the Jews went to war, they took the Aron with them. So you are the God who is going to be in war with the enemy as well. Atahu Elohim, you are the God. Levadcham. By alone, you're the only God. You're the one who created all of the nations. In other words, when he talked about, when Sancheru was talking about the other gods, that's blasphemous. All those other cities that fell, all those other kingdoms that fell, are kingdoms that are under the Hashgacha, under the protection and the, and the oversight of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and no one else. Hateo Hashem Oznecha Vishma Ushma. Turn your ear and listen. Remember, what is he listening to? He's listening to the giduv, to the blasphemy. Pekach Hashem Enech, or see the danger that we are in. 
Ushmat kol divrei Sancher v'asher shalach lecharef elokim chai. And hear all the words of Sancher that he sent to blaspheme the living God. Again, this he's focusing more on the blasphemy than any other thing he's focusing on. And at that point, Om Hashem, he says, listen, Om Hashem means, okay, let's admit, we will admit, Okay, they've already wreaked the, the destruction everywhere they've gone. And they have burnt all of the idols, all of the, the gods of those places. They're not God. They're just uh, the works of, of, of wood or stone, and therefore they could be destroyed. You, Hashem, you save us. And when you do this, everyone will know that you are the only God. Now, remember this kind of uh, appeal that we have. For instance, when Moshe Rabbeinu, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, he's going to destroy the Jews. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, what are the rest of the nations of the world going to say? That you didn't have the power to take the Jewish people out and into Eretz Yisrael. Here he says this, he's a similar kind of plea. It's not going to be you take him out, you save us, and the rest of the world will know that you're the God. So the prayer is over, and now Yeshayahu gives his prophecy. Now, we talked about the fact that these three prakim, Lamed Vav, Lamed Zayin, and Lamed Ched, are there, the historical record are there to give context specifically to the prophecies. Because otherwise, why do we go back into the narrative story mode, like in other Sfarim? Well, it gives that necessary narrative. We understand why Yeshayahu's prophecy is coming in. And this prophecy is going to take us through much of the rest of the parak up until the destruction of Sancherev's army. And so he sends to Chizkiyahu the following prophecy. Thus said God, the God of Israel, who you prayed to me, El Sancher of Melech Ashur. This is one of those cases where the word El is like the word Al regarding Sancher, the king of Ashur. Zadava. This is what Asher Diber Hashem Alav, what God said about him. Bazalacha laagalacha betulat batzion. You are being mocked. You are being made fun of by the Betulat Batzion, by the Jewish people, okay, we called, okay, that the Jewish people are referred to as Betulat Batzion, as the virgin, the daughter of Israel, because they haven't been conquered. No one really can rule over them. That's the Mitzudat David. Okay, however, according to the Dat Mikra, these are just classic poetic terms that are used regarding the um, the honor of the Jewish people. Achare Rosh Heniam. And after you, they've, they've been shaking their head about you, Bat Yerushalayim. In other words, again, making fun of you. Bat Yerushalayim, the Targum Yonatan says, the nation, the Amad Yerushalayim, the people living in Yerushalayim. Et mi cherafta v'gidafta. Who have you been mocking? Now, cheraf v'giduf, just to know that um, the Malbim points out, cheraf v'giduf, while we use them as interchangeable terms for blasphemy, cheraf can be used not just for blasphemy against God, it can also be insults against other people. Giduf is specifically blasphemy. The two of them together are the more powerful form that you would find. Valmi Harimota call and who have you been yelling against? Batisama Romanecha Kadosh Israel and raised your eyes up against God. Bi um Biyad Avadecha Khirafta Hashem. You through your servants you have blasphemed God Batomer, and you've claimed. You've claimed that, listen, what I have done is I have conquered, I've gone all the way up with my chariots to the heights of the mountains, to the ends of the Lebanon. Now, Rashi uses the Midrashic um, explanation here because Rashi really wonders why is the geography of of where he has conquered so significant. And so we know back, still back from, say, from Melachim, Shmuel, I'm sorry, Shmuel and, and Melachim, Levanon is another terminology 
for the Beit HaMikdash. So it's as if with my chariots, I've come up from above. Okay, I've come up to the above. What's the above, according to Rashi? The mountains of Harabai, to the Temple Mount. I'm up to the Temple Mount. I have gone to the end of Lebanon, to the, to the edge of Lebanon. I've come up to the edge of the Harabait. And I have cut down the heights of the cedars and the best of the cypresses. And I will come. And I will come all the way to the end, to the end of the heights, to the forest of his Carmel. Again, all of this, if I take it from the Midrashic approach, what he's saying is, I've come up and I'm all the way with my chariots at Yerushalayim to the Harabayit, and I'm going to cut it down. I'm going to destroy it. According to the Pshat, the Pshat is a little, says, no, no, he's bragging about all of his military conquests. He's gone up into the mountains. He cut cut down the highest trees, the best, the cypresses and the cedars were 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 most valuable wood that was there. And there's also part of what this uh, of what the treasures of Eretz Yisrael. I've gone to the Carmel. The Carmel doesn't mean necessarily the mountain, even though some before she talk about the mountain of Carmel by Haifa, but Carmel is also the fruit the the, the 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 places of of great produce and fruits. Anikarti vishatiti mayim. I have dug and I have been able to drink water. Now karti is an interesting word. Karti comes from the word makor, the same word as the source. Okay, karti and makor are from the same source. By the way, it most likely also is related to the word um, kar. Even though the different shorashim, but the the kufresh have the similarities because when you have that spring water, it's always a cool spring water. I've gone that va'achri bekaf bekaf amai kol yaore matzor, and I have destroyed with my foot, with the feet of all of my soldiers, the yaore matzor. Now yaore matzor, according to the radak very simply, are the waters, the channels that were created to provide water into cities that are besieged. We know Chizkiyahu did that as well. Well, he says, my soldiers are so many that they just trampled down all of those pieces. There are the other reforms say, no, that the Or Mitzor, Mitzor is Mitzrayim, that we have also cut off all the water of Mitzrayim because that's the other battle he's doing. With Tirakai, he's dealing in the south with the king of of uh, of Egypt, I've taken care of all of that. Hello, Shamata, didn't you hear the Mirachokota city? Now Yeshayahu says after talking about all of the things that uh, Sancheirev is bra bragging about, Yeshayahu turns to him and says, "Didn't you hear? All of this was from far off, or all of the things that you have accomplished were decreed long ago." We may him. From the earliest of days, and all of this was my creation, says God. I gave you this power to be able to, to conquer what you conquered and to ultimately take all of these cities and take them just into the galam, galim nitzim. Galim nitzim are like piles of stones, the destruction. And it seemed like the word nitzutz um, sprouting, that um, Rav Schwab says moss covered uh, heaps. Because what you once you destroy something and it sits there for a long time, moss starts growing over them. I've done all of this. This isn't you, son Cherev. The the people who you have um, conquered, those are people that Rashi, as Rashi quotes. God says, I have taken away their power. Says these people are just like the like nothing. In other words, they were like um they uh weren't able to move anywhere when they just were cut down like the, the grass in the field, and ultimately, like the um the the plague against the uh the 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 uh, grain, all of these things for me. God says to Sanacher, I know everything you've been doing, all that you've done, all of your things. Okay, they weren't from you, they were from me. 
Vatai, he tragezcha Eli, and you have this chutzpah to go ahead and be angry against me, to blaspheme me. Yan, he tragezcha Eli, because you have done so. Vesha'anancha alab oznaim, and your roaring, your noise have gone up into my ears. I'm going to put a bit into your mouth. And I'm going to put a, um, um, a nose ring. Okay. I'm going to lead you off where you were. If you think about it, he's saying, I'm, I'm going to treat you like the animal you are in a sense. But also, interestingly, uh, Jacob Jaffe in, one, in his commentary on the Chizkiyahu says, and, and Yeshayahu notes that God is saying, you had the chutzpah to yell. What am I going to do? I'm going to muzzle you. I'm going to put something in your mouth. You're not going to be able to do it anymore. And this is going to be the sign. This year, the Jewish people are going to be able to eat and be able to be sustained just from those things that grow naturally. And the second year, they're going to eat the shachis. Now, shachis, mm -hmm. interestingly, we're not 100% sure what that means, but the Mitzudot says, the things that grow naturally from things that grow naturally. So it's like the Sviach normally is when you don't plant, there are always seeds left and stuff sprouts up. That's year one. Year two is going to be the stuff that sprouts from the things that sprouts. And why, but why weren't they planting in year one so they could eat from year two? And so the Rabag says, it's very simple. Year two was a Shemitah year. So they couldn't do the normal things that they were doing. Okay. And in the third year, period. Third year, you're going to be able to, to eat and to have everything. You're going to be able to plant. Um, you're going to harvest. You're going to be able to eat all the fruits of the field. And the Jewish people are going to be gathered together and they're going to create deep roots. They're going to have that which is deep down, and they're going to have the fruits above. Now, it could be talking both about the produce, but it could also be talking about the Jewish people at the same time. Because from Yerushalayim will come out the remnant, and this, the survivors or those who, who uh, survivors from the Mount Zion, Kinat Hashem Tzvakota says, the zealous God, okay, is going to do this. Lachen, Ko Amar Hashem El Melech Hashur. Therefore, this is what Melech Hashur needs to hear. Lo Yavo Ela You're not going to go to Yerush You're not going to get to Yerushalayim. Velo Yerusham Chetz. And you're not going to be able to shoot an arrow. Velo Yikadmenam again. And the shields are not going to go there at all. In other words, very simply, that means the soldiers are not, soldiers are the ones who carry the shields. The soldiers are not going to be able to get to the city itself. Velo Yishpoch Alea Solela. And you're not going to be even to have ramparts built to take down the city. Now, interestingly, this issue of ramparts, if you remember in the Rassam Cylinder, there he claims that they had built those ramparts against walls in Jerusalem. We don't know, you know, we don't know if he did or he didn't, or he's just bragging, you know, as, as the Rassam Cylinder seems to imply that he's bragging about what he did. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells him, you're not going to accomplish anything. And then, Bader HaShar Ba Bad Yeshu. From where you, from the way you came, is the way you're going to leave. And you're never going to come to this city. This is the word of God. And I'm going to save the city for my sake and for the sake of David, of D, for the sake of David. Now, interestingly, why is Hagodish Borah saying for my sake and for the sake of King David? This is the source of the Midrashim that say that the people at the time of Chizkiah didn't have enough merit on their own. They're drawing in the schut avot, the merit of King David, over the city of Jerusalem, as opposed to their own merit. Why wouldn't God do it for himself? Well, God does it together with the merit of, of King David, because it's the people, the city, and HaKadosh Baruch, who's honored that's being saved at this time. 
Interestingly, by the way, it's going to be Chizkiyahu is going to be the last of the kings to refer to the schut of David. This isn't the last case. Uh, historically, it's the last case in the same, but historically, it was um, Perakhov was the last time that that happened. And it's going to shift afterwards, which is the source of yet another machloket, which we have in Chazal, as to whether or not schut avot, the merit of our forefathers, runs out. Is there a limited amount of schut or not, there's a three-way machloket in the Gemara about that. One opinion says the reason why after Chizkiah we don't see the drawing of the schut avot is because it was used up. They used up all their credit, and then they, then we were on our own. We'll stop right here. Uh, next week we will have Shir. We'll find out the last piece of the Chizkiah story, and then we're going to enter into the second part of Sefer Yeshayahu, the the Nechama, the, the the prophecies of comfort which is also a bit, is a little controversial in the non-Jewish world as to who the authors of that was. So if you ever hear about Isaiah too, and we'll deal with it then, in two weeks, we'll start dealing with the sections which some uh, misclassify uh, as Isaiah too. It is a second Sec voice of Isaiah, but it isn't a different Isaiah. We'll stop here. Have a wonderful day.